Hey, this is Sky. Welcome to my YouTube channel. It's bright and early. Daily discipline. Mind, body, and soul. This is how we get through. Got some Egyptian musk incense. I'm about to light up. Got some desert music going. I kind of feel like in a desert mood. Maybe it's because I live in the jungle. <laughs> like those opposite climates, I seem to either want to be in the desert or in the mountains. A lot of times I have to learn to just be content where I'm at. Life is about choice. Sunday, let's do our study group for warriors. Basically, what this is, is I just go over my notes. I take notes every single day. It's part of the Mind, Body, and Soul program, a program that I live that saved my life, that's been around for thousands of years and that I coach and mentor. And if you want to get on my schedule for mentoring or coaching, go check out my website at skyazrael.com. I always put the link below. We're building subscribers. It's weird because I'm almost at a thousand subscribers, which means maybe, I don't know how it works, maybe I'll get monetized. That'd be nice. However, my videos only get like 20 or 30 views tops. I could get like maybe 30, 40 views on each video. So I'm not really sure if I'll get monetized because I think you have to have more than that. People actually have to watch your videos. <laughs> but to the two or three people that follow me, let's do our study group. Let's get into this. I was studying string theory earlier in the week. Let me turn this music down a little bit so it doesn't distract you guys. It appears that string theory is dead. Eric Weinstein, who I'm a fan of, sometimes. <laughs> I go back and forth on being a fan of his. The guy's brilliant. He really is. You can't say that he's dumb. He's a smart dude. But sometimes I'm just not sure if he's pushing his own agenda or if he's actually trying to explore truth. It's hard to tell. And his brother, Brett, who's also very smart, I'm a fan of his sometimes also and sometimes not, but Eric came out last week in a video on a panel of guests and they were all discussing how string theory is dead and how people like Michio Akaku and others have been pushing this for the last 40 years, hijacking the university systems and basically all of physics. If you try to become a physicist and study something else other than string theory. God forbid you say string theory is a bunch of thought experiments that have no actual evidence and it's all a bunch of nonsense. Then sure, maybe you might be able to loosely base a couple of math equations to back up what you're saying, but that's hardly proof. And it might be time to move on because string theory is dead and this is what they're suggesting. But that is offensive. That's apparently a big no-no. You'll be fired, you'll be ruined. You'll even have death threats put upon you. This is the scientific community. It's really crazy. Here's a question. Let's go on to the next one. Is it okay to be happy? That's an honest question that I've had to ask myself. Is it okay for me to be happy? Because I've spent so much of my life miserable, so much of my life struggling, so much of my life unhappy that that became my norm. And then when I get happy, these fleeting moments, when I get happy, it feels like it's not okay. It feels like something's wrong. <laughs> Is it okay to be happy? I think I have to tell myself a mantra, an affirmation of, yes, it's okay to be happy. I got happy last week, noticeably, where I was like, whoa, I'm happy. You ever notice that you're happy? I've been handling business this week. I've had a great week, like a life-changing week. And I found a new form of happiness that I haven't really been around in a while. And it felt a little weird. At first I felt a little guilty. Like maybe I shouldn't be so happy. Maybe I need to be more miserable. <laughs> I'll tell you about my be miserable story sometime. Oh, there's a conspiracy afoot by corporate America to make you upset and it's to sell you products. And it's been proven that people buy more, they shop more when they're upset. 
but I'll get into that. And I believe this. This is an actual conspiracy. But I'll tell you that on the conspiracy news when we do another episode of that. We might be due for another episode of conspiracy news. I'm doing peppermint tea this morning. I think that's my favorite tea. Let's go to the next one. You ever notice on, online, particularly on Instagram, that everybody's trying to flex what they got? Muscles, money, this lifestyle. It's like everybody. Women, men, everybody. And if they don't have it, they're trying to get it. And as soon as they get it, they want to flex it. They want to show it off. It's like that's what some of you guys, your young people, that's what your dream is, is to, to be the next Andrew Tate. And not just to live his lifestyle in silence, in solitude, uh, where no one knows you, but you want to actually be famous and noticed and drive around in your Bugatti and sign autographs and have this be you and be some ripped and rich, muscle-bound influencer. As if that's utopia. That's the goal in life. It's weird. My generation doesn't really have that. We, we didn't grow up on Instagram or social media looking at this fraudulent imagery. When someone my age sees this stuff, I just roll my eyes and I'm like, yeah, that's rented. That's bullshit. Why would you want a Bugatti anyways? It costs $25,000 to get a damn oil change. I don't care how rich you are. $25,000 for an oil change is stupid. You want to waste that kind of money? Go give it to some poor family across town. Go drive along the freeway, throwing it out the window. It's a better investment than your stupid Bugatti. Let's go to the next one. Here's a little lesson for some of you young guys. Fucking and fighting won't make you a man. There was years I spent in the bars and my rule was by midnight, midnight. If I wasn't with a chick, I'm gonna go home and bang her out some one night stand with some dumb whore, some dumb bar slut. If I wasn't already with that plan, I would literally, I'm not kidding, literally, just pick somebody across the bar, I don't care who it is, just pick any dude. And not some small little chump. You big boys, oh, you think you're so badass, the biggest, baddest motherfucker in the bar? <laughs> you're mine, bitch, you're mine. Outside, right now, me and you, I'm gonna fuck you up and I would do this seven nights a week. If I wasn't fucking, I was fighting. That won't make you a man, that's not manhood. There's nothing in that that's manhood. And I'll take it further. You street cats out there thinking that this drug dealer mentality, this imagery, that's not manhood either. Waving your guns around. I see these young boys in these videos, these rap videos, waving their little guns around. It's, it's not manhood. A pistol won't make you a man. Your tattoos on your face and your neck, that doesn't make you a man. Let's move on to the next one. Did you know it says in the Bible that it's a disgrace in the eyes of God to be a lazy man? <laughs> it's a disgrace. Your laziness is a sin. God is ashamed of you fat, lazy men. You out of shape. Losers who go nowhere and do nothing. You don't study, you don't work out, you don't eat right, you don't pray. You're not a go-getter. You're not out there trying to level up. You're not trying to start businesses. You're not trying to help anybody. You're selfish little brats playing video games. What, waiting for death? Waiting for utopia? It's a disgrace in the eyes of God to be a lazy man. Let's go on to the next one. You ever notice how our grandparents' generation, well maybe not your grandparents' generation, I might be your grandparents' age, I don't know how young people are that watch this channel, but if you're my age, our grandparents' generation, and I'm Gen X, for you people that think I'm a baby boomer, go fuck yourself up your ass, I'm not a baby boomer, you stupid idiots. There's a difference between Gen X and baby boomers. <laughs> but our grandparents' generation didn't get divorced. Divorce became popular with the baby boomers. The baby boomers didn't invent it, obviously, but they promoted it. They are 
the most divorced people. Go ask any one of them, any baby boomer. They've had three, four, five, six, seven marriages. My dad was married seven times. My mom's been married three times. Every one of them gets divorced and divorce is one of their highest values. And they, they, the baby boomers, when I say they, I mean the baby boomers, redefined love in the late 60s, early 70s. They, they redefined what marriage was. It's so huge to think about that they redefined love, the highest value on earth for all humans. And these postmodernist liberals redefined it to where selfishness came into play. What's marriage for? To, 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 to look into the eyes of your beautiful queen every day until you die. I love you, I love you, oh, I love you. Is, is, is that what marriage is for? So you can have a relationship like that? Some fantasy out of a fairy tale? Our grandparents weren't into that kind of stuff. It was more utilitarian, more of a business plan. And for rich or poor, great or small, Good or bad, hard times are easy, they stayed together. Why? For family. Family fell apart under the hippies, under the baby boomers. Almost everybody that I grew up with out in the streets had a single parent family. That really wasn't a thing with the baby boomers. The baby boomers didn't grow up in single parent families because their parents, my grandparents, their parents, the baby boomers' parents stayed together, raised them right. Isn't it interesting that the baby boomers rebelled against traditional masculinity? They rebelled against traditional love and created this world full of weak, emasculated, bitch-made men who don't know how to take care of their women and women who don't know how to be women. Let's move on to the next one. Here's something that's rather controversial that I've been studying a little bit. And you don't have to get down with it if you don't want to. It's just something that I've been studying. And I'm not even sure if I'm really on page with this, but I find it interesting. And I've been studying manhood and what biblical manhood looks like. Mainly because the Bible talks about it. <laughs> These days it's hard to find sources to learn about manhood. So there's a hierarchy of man. The hierarchy of man is God the Father that sits at the top. It's not the God the Mother. God is the Father. The Father of all creation. Man was created in the image of God. And man sits under God. The hierarchy goes God, man. Under man is woman. Woman was created from man, according to the Bible, Adam's rib. Woman was created for man. Why was Eve created? For Adam. She was created from Adam and she was created for Adam. So women sit under men. It goes God, men, women, and then under women are children. They're her responsibility primarily. Well, the men is out working. The men are out hunting. The men are out killing the enemy and protecting the village. And that's a rather misogynist kind of hierarchy because a lot of people think, especially women or weaklings, they seem to think that this implies that men dominate women and rule over women as if this is some sort of slave-master relationship. Man is a slave to God and women are a slave to men and children are a slave to women. That's not what this means. That's not what the hierarchy means. And the way I take this and have tried to internalize this is that every group, your family is a group. That's all it is. It's a group of people. Every group of people has to have a leader. And it happens organically. It's rare to find any group, even a board of directors, where there's not a leader. A leader emerges, and people want that to happen. And that's why man is at the top of the 
the, the, the family structure. It has nothing to do with misogyny or patriarchy or dominance or something that you think is negative. We can talk about that for a while. And again, I'm, I'm not an expert in that. I've just been studying it. Let's move on. I know we're getting deep into the video here. Do another one. I'm always sore from the gym. Always. I work out six days a week. You guys should be doing at least three days a week. I have a hard time getting you guys to do even two days a week sometimes. But one of the reasons why I'm in the gym is because of the soreness. I was thinking about this earlier in the week and I've been extra sore this week because I've been really pounding it. Your body is repairing itself from damage. That's what the soreness is. The soreness that you feel from a workout is damage to your muscles. When you work out, you're literally damaging your muscles. You're tearing your muscle fiber. That's how you work out. And then your muscles repair themselves, amino acids, proteins, and that kind of thing, and they grow stronger and bigger depending on how you're working out. When you repair yourself, when your body repairs itself from the damage, from that trauma, because you're inflicting, it's a self-inflicted trauma when you work out, when you exercise. Your body repairs itself stronger. So isn't that interesting that within the context of working out in a very controlled way, as long as you're doing the movements right and eating right, there's a lot of factors to it. The damage makes you stronger. The pain makes you stronger. The trauma makes you stronger. The soreness is the path to strength. So I look forward to the soreness because I realize this is my strength. Could you look at trauma that way? And get excited over your trauma as a path to strength. This is what post-traumatic growth is about. And I talk about this with some of you in my coaching sessions. Have a great Sunday.